It is my pleasure to introduce Jennifer Kempianen, um, one of our genetic counselors uh, here at Mayo Clinic, and she's going to talk about the importance of genetics in ovarian cancer. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as Dr. Bakum Gama said, my name is Jennifer and I work as a genetic counselor at Mayo Clinic. I've been a genetic counselor here at Mayo Clinic for the past seven years and have had many different roles over the years, um, but my primary role is providing cancer consultations to patients and families when we're suspecting hereditary cancer. So today I wanted to give a general introduction and overview to genetics and ovarian cancer. Some of you in the room may have already gone through genetic counseling and genetic testing. Some of you may have a genetic diagnosis or this may be new information to you. So I'm, my plan is to keep this more of a general conversation about genetics and ovarian cancer and happy to answer more specific questions in the Q&A afterwards. I want to introduce you to the genetic counseling and genetic testing process and then how genetic testing may impact a um, both the patient and the family. So one of the first pieces a genetic counselor often talks about when they meet with the family is a, the statistics associated with cancer. Um, and so we know that cancer in general is very common in the United States. Most cancer is diagnosed later in life. And the majority of the time, it is not genetic. So when we think about general statistics, in general, we think about 5 to 10 percent of cancer has a hereditary or genetic basis. But this is a little bit different when we narrow in on ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is a more rare cancer compared to other cancers like lung cancer or skin cancer or breast cancer. And we do know that there's a higher proportion of individuals with ovarian cancer that do have a genetic component to their disease. Right now, the estimate is about 15 to 20 percent of patients with ovarian cancer will have a genetic component. The remainder of ovarian cancer at this point in time we think is sporadic. Now, the term sporadic um, is a term that we give to cancer that we don't think has a genetic component, that could be part of the aging process, that could be due to environmental factors, or could be due to other genetic factors or a combination of any of these that we don't completely understand at this point in time. So when we meet with a patient and a family, what are some of those characteristics? Since cancer is so common and the majority of it is not genetic, what are those characteristics that we look for in a family that does make us more suspicious of a hereditary cancer syndrome? Well, one of the, the aspects that we look for is the same or related type of cancer in multiple relatives in multiple generations in a family. Um, so if you look at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a family pedigree. It looks like these symbols, squares are men, uh, circles are women, and the shading indicates if somebody's had a cancer diagnosis. So as you can see here in this example, there are three generations of women that are impacted by breast and ovarian cancer. We know that breast and ovarian cancer can cluster in families. We know that ovarian cancer can cluster with other types of cancers, like colon and uterine cancer. So every hereditary cancer syndrome has, may have different types of cancers um, that cluster in a family, and that's something that we look at. We look at age of diagnosis. So generally speaking, age 50 and younger is considered an early diagnosis for cancer. Now, the, the caveat with this is ovarian cancer. We generally look at a diagnosis of ovarian cancer in a family and think about that because it is more of a rare cancer that there could be a, a genetic component regardless of the age of diagnosis. But for some of the other cancers that we look at, like breast cancer and colon cancer, we are looking for a more earlier presentation in a family. And as you can see here on the pedigree, again, we're seeing these diagnoses of women with breast cancer in their 30s and 40s and women with ovarian cancer in their 40s and 50s. We look for multiple primary cancers. So has anybody had more than one type of cancer, like two breast cancers or a breast and ovarian cancer? We look at more rare types of cancers. So ovarian cancer as a whole is much more rare compared to other types of cancers. So if we see two ovarian cancers in a family, that may be a red flag for us to be thinking about a hereditary component, as well as other rare diagnoses such as male breast cancer. And then we look for a lack of environmental factors or other types of risk factors. It's not uncommon that if we, if anybody, if we talk with anybody, that they may have 
a family history of cancer. Just like most people have a family history of someone with heart disease or dementia or stroke or diabetes. Um, but what we're looking for, again, are these early diagnoses in individuals that we wouldn't be suspecting a, a high risk for cancer otherwise. If somebody is a lifelong smoker or has a lot of sun exposure, we know that they have a higher risk of developing cancer because of some of those environmental factors. So these are all of the different things that we think about when looking at a family and thinking about could there be that hereditary component. So. I wanted to give a brief introduction to genetics um, because I, as a genetic counselor, one of the things that we come across often is a lack of understanding about genetics and about cancer genes and what they mean. So I'm just gonna give a brief overview here. Um, on this slide, what this is highlighting is that our body is made up of millions of cells. In, within every one of our cells is our genetic material. And the genetic material, that term is often called DNA. And we can think about DNA like a blueprint or a recipe. Each gene has, uh, has DNA content, and each gene is functioning like a separate recipe in our body. We've got over 20,000 genes, and each of these genes has a specific and important role in our body. And that recipe creates a protein. And so the idea when we think about hereditary cancer and hereditary cancer syndromes are the genes that we're talking about are, are essentially good genes. These are genes that both men and women have, and we want them to be functioning appropriately. When we get concerned is when somebody is born with a mistake, also known as a mutation within one of these genes, and that predisposes them to be at a significantly increased risk of developing cancer. So this is um, one of the ideas of behind this, and often patients ask us, why is it if I have a gene mutation, am I at that increased risk of getting cancer? Well, the idea behind this and the theory behind this is that if somebody is born with a mutation in one of these good genes, and most of these genes are thought to be tumor suppressor genes, so they fight off the formation of tumors in our body, is that if somebody is born with a mutation in this gene, that gene is already inactivated. It's not able to do its job. And cells that carry that mutation may be more susceptible to damage, and those damaged cells may le lead to tumor formation down the line. But an important aspect to remember with a hereditary cancer syndrome is that if somebody has a gene mutation, it does not mean that they're going to get cancer. And we see plenty of families where two individuals may have a gene mutation and one has an early onset cancer diagnosis while somebody else lives later in life and never develops cancer. So having a hereditary cancer syndrome or having a gene mutation doesn't mean that someone will get cancer. It just means that they are uh, predisposed and have a highly significant risk of getting cancer. So of the 15 to 20% of ovarian cancer, that is genetic. If we narrow in on that a little bit more and say, okay, what are the genes that are involved? Probably most of you in this room have heard about the BRCA genes, or the BRCA genes as they're called. And these are the major players in hereditary ovarian cancer. We know that about half of all ovarian cancer are due to mutations within the BRCA1 gene, while a quarter of hereditary cancer are due to mutations in the BRCA2 gene. But that leaves a quarter um, that are due to mutations in other genes. And these are genes that we are learning more and more information about every year. Some of these conditions and genes include Lynch syndrome, which is a syndrome that's associated with primarily with colon and uterine cancer, as well as other abdominal cancers and ovarian cancer. And then some newer genes, and we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail later, like BRIP1, RAD51C, RAD51D, and there's probably still families out there that have a genetic component to the cancer, but we haven't discovered the genetic cause at this point in time. We're learning more and more about genetics, and we know that we'll continue to discover new genes associated with hereditary cancer syndromes. So now I wanna transition and talk a little bit about the genetic counseling and genetic testing process. So um, as I mentioned, some of you may have already gone through this and know what to expect, but some of you may have heard of genetic counseling or you have family members that you wanna explain a little bit more information to about this process. <laughs> 
So the general definition of genetic counseling, it's the process of helping people understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic disease. So really what that means is we work with families, we ask about their medical and family history, we educate them about hereditary cancer conditions, we provide support, um, we make sure that individuals have a good understanding of this process and of genetic testing. We support patient decisions and we help facilitate genetic testing if that is what the patient or family is interested in. I'm not going to go through this whole list here, but these are some different pieces, um, different aspects to think about of when to consider genetic counseling. And so in the middle of that list, you can see ovarian cancer. So there have been recommendations that have changed over the past few years that now support any woman with ovarian cancer should consider genetic counseling and is eligible for genetic testing. This has been a, a change where we saw even a couple of years ago, there were age specific limits, meaning that if if a patient had ovarian cancer over a certain age, that there may not be that recommendation there. But now that has changed. So really the clear message that I want to make is that anybody who's had ovarian cancer can consider genetic counseling and genetic testing. And then there are a variety of other types of indications here, and some of these we've already talked about. So thinking about those early types um, of cancer, thinking about some of the more rare types of cancer like male breast cancer or triple negative breast cancer, um, certain ethnic backgrounds like Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, um, if that somebody has a family history of a known gene mutation. These are all different aspects that we think about for people who are would be have an appropriate referral for genetic counseling. So we've talked a little bit about what to expect during the genetic counseling appointment. This is typically something that's about a 45 to 60 minute conversation where a genetic counselor will meet with somebody and talk about that medical, um, that person's medical history, um, get in-depth information about their family history, typically going back three generations, wanting to understand who's had cancer, who's not had cancer, um, and then t uh, who's had genetic testing in the family because that can provide some insight. Um, giving that education about hereditary cancer, what it means and what it doesn't mean. Having a discussion about genetic testing, and we'll talk about those details in a moment. And then talking about how to go about the facilitation of genetic testing and how to get results and how that may impact a family. So genetic testing, um, a lot of you have probably seen commercials out there for different kits and um, things like 23andMe and ancestry testing. Um, there's a variety of different types of tests out there. Some of these tests are considered direct to consumer, meaning they're more built to be and more what we would call kind of entertainment-based testing, finding out ancestry and looking at different types of genetic markers. Um, and then there are there is clinical genetic testing, and that's something that is typically done through a laboratory um, that is certified and does comprehensive testing. Um, there are labs that offer that directly to patients, like Color Genomics um, is a laboratory, and there are a variety of clinical labs um, around the country that offer this testing as well. Typically, this is a blood sample. It also can be a saliva sample. We can use other tissue sources as well. Um, and this is something that we usually are focusing on multi-gene panel testing. So this is also gonna be a change. So if some of you had went through the genetic testing process even a couple of years ago, this looks different today than it did several years ago. Um, often, initially, when genetic testing was being offered to patients with ovarian cancer, the focus was on looking at the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Now we know that there are over 20 genes that are associated with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. So typically, instead of doing a gene-by-gene -gene approach, we want to do a multi-gene panel where we look at all of those genes at one point in time to see if we can identify a mutation in the family. And if individuals have undergone targeted testing where they may have only looked at BRCA1 and 2 in the past, they would be eligible to do a multi-gene panel um, today or in the future. Um, so this is always a moving target, and that's one thing that I emphasize to patients and families, is genetic testing is based on what we know today. That may look very different tomorrow, a year from now, five years from now. So if somebody in the family has had negative genetic testing, it still may be relevant to consider more genetic testing in the future. <laughs> 
The average turnaround time for genetic testing is about three to four weeks. Um, there are different types of tests um, that may take longer or may be shorter, but in general, we're looking at about three to four weeks to get results back. There have been a lot of changes with regard to cost in insurance coverage of genetic testing. So historically, genetic testing has been very expensive, and insurance companies may or may not have covered that testing in the past. I will say in our practice here, um, we see uh, dozens of patients with cancer every week, and insurance coverage is something that is often a concern that patients have, but it's also something that we can often put their minds at ease. Most individuals with a personal history of cancer, especially ovarian cancer, their insurance company will cover genetic testing. This includes Medicare, which has updated their guidelines to cover genetic testing for ovarian cancer, um, as well as most most commercial insurance companies and state-based programs like Medicaid. Also, we've seen the cost um, dramatically reduce in terms of there are multiple labs that offer this testing. And so now there are self-pay prices and low out-of-pocket costs. So these are, this is something that we, we really want to emphasize, that genetic testing um, is something that most individuals are eligible for from their insurance company. But even if insurance is not going to cover testing, there are still a lot of labs that offer very low fee costs for testing and even no cost options out there. And then when somebody goes through genetic testing and results come back, this is something that may, may be provided in person, in the phone, by phone, or through the mail. And then genetic counselors can also help with family member recommendations. So we don't just focus on the patient in front of us. We know that a genetic diagnosis applies to the entire family, and we really want to try to help families navigate a new genetic diagnosis and making sure that other family members are able to seek genetic counseling and appropriate recommendations. So I want to walk through a little bit about genetic testing. When those results come back, what does this mean for a patient and what does this mean for a family? So if a genetic test comes back positive, that means that that individual has an increased chance for certain types of cancer. This is very specific to the gene mutation that is identified. Um, so having a mutation in the BRCA1 gene does not mean that somebody is at an increased risk for all types of cancers, but it does mean that they may have an increased risk for breast and ovarian cancer along with prostate and pancreatic cancer. So we know that these gene, each gene is associated with specific cancer risks, and that's where um, a genetic counselor or other medical provider can help a patient walk through what that information means. So when somebody is diagnosed with a gene mutation, we talk about what screening is involved associated with that gene mutation. Most of these genes have national recommendations when there's a mutation present that indicate increased screening. Now that may mean increased breast screening, that may mean increased colonoscopies or other types of screens that are available. And then that also may mean that there are preventative options and recommendations like surgery that are also available for patients and family members. And then this may also alter treatment recommendations. We know that as we're learning more about some of these hereditary cancer syndromes, there are certain um, therapies that are going to be targeted at a particular genetic diagnosis. So that's something that um, is it may be an important tool for an oncologist to know if somebody has a BRCA gene mutation as that may impact their treatment. And then also, um, as a part of this, is if somebody, if a patient has a gene mutation, there's a high risk that this was something they inherited from their parents, that their siblings may be at risk, and this is something that they may pass down to their children. Most of these conditions are considered dominant conditions. And what that means is that if a family member has a gene mutation, their siblings and their children would have up to a 50% chance of also inheriting that gene mutation. So there can be significant implications for not only the patient, but the family when we do identify a gene mutation. So this is a table that I just wanted to um, highlight some of the known cancer risks as well as what we do for those families when we find a mutation. So what you'll see in the first column um, are the names of the gene, 
And then the second column focuses on what we know for the breast cancer lifetime risk. The third column focuses on the ovarian cancer lifetime risk. And the last column focuses on the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, meaning the recommendations that are out there for families when they're identified with one of these mutations. So as of no surprise, when we look at the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, they do have slightly different risks associated with them, but we usually group them together when we're talking about risk and what the recommendations are for individuals. So it has a striking risk for breast cancer. So this risk is 40 to 50% or greater for an initial breast cancer, and there's quite an elevated risk of developing a second primary breast cancer down the line. And with both of these genes, there's also a significant risk of the development of ovarian cancer. And these are going to be, again, out of all of the genes, these genes have the highest lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer. So based on that, uh, NCCN has recommended increased breast screening for these families. That typically starts at the age of 25 and includes a mammogram and a breast MRI. A risk-reducing mastectomy can be considered to uh, reduce that risk of de the development of breast cancer. And then also because of the lack of screening for ovarian cancer, a risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy is something that is also discussed for women typically in their uh, mid to late 30s. If we go down the list, the next gene in line is a newer gene that we know of called the BRIP1 gene. This is not known to be associated with breast cancer at this time, but this is a newer gene that's been more recently discovered, so we're continuing to learn more about this. We do know that there's about a 10 to 15% lifetime risk of, the de of developing ovarian cancer, and because of that, there is a recommendation of consideration of a salpingo oophorectomy. Next, we have the Lynch syndrome genes, and as I mentioned, these are primarily associated with colon and uterine cancer, um, but we also have seen ovarian cancer in these families as well. The risk for these cancers is dependent on the Lynch genes, and at this point in time, there are five known genes associated with Lynch syndrome, but the range estimate is anywhere between 5 and 15 percent, and again, that risk-reducing salpingo oophorectomy is recommended um, from an ovarian standpoint, because there's a risk for uterine cancer, typically they are also recommending hysterectomy um, be performed as well. And then the last two genes are similar to BRIP1, meaning that these are more newly discovered genes as well. We don't know of a strong risk for breast cancer associated with these genes, but that remains unknown at this point in time. We may learn additional details. Both of these genes have an estimate of about a 10 to 15 percent lifetime risk for ovarian cancer and the same recommendations for consideration of a salpingo oophorectomy for these families. So these are the primary um, genes that we know are associated with hereditary ovarian cancer. As I mentioned, there are other genes that we know may have a tie with ovarian cancer and that we're continuing to learn more about. So this list is always going to be changing and likely will be growing as we learn more and more about hereditary cancer genetics. So I wanted to touch on negative genetic testing. So oftentimes when I talk with patients about genetic testing and we let them know that they have negative test results, there's a sigh of relief and they say, oh, I'm glad to hear this isn't genetic and no one else in my family needs to be worried. And that's a comment um, that we want to caution in patients and families. Negative genetic testing lowers the chance that there's a hereditary cancer syndrome but it does not eliminate the possibility of a gene mutation or a hereditary risk. And the reason for that is we're only looking at the genes we understand today. If we know of five more genes that are associated with ovarian cancer in two years from now, you wouldn't have been tested for those today. And so there could be a mutation in a different gene in your family that we just don't know about at this point in time. And then also, genetic testing isn't perfect. Genetic testing has not been around that long, and we know that our testing could miss something. And so that's something else that we also want to emphasize, is that a negative test result greatly reduces the likelihood of a hereditary cancer syndrome in the family, but it does not eliminate it, 
and family members may still have an increased risk of developing cancer, and their screening should be based on that family history. So there, if somebody has a family history of ovarian cancer, they may want to talk with their provider about a risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy. Or if someone has a family history of breast and colon cancer, additional screening may be warranted just on the basis of that family history and not on the basis of the negative genetic test result. So lastly, I want to talk about some of the benefits of genetic testing as well as some of the limitations. So the benefits of genetic testing are that we can understand if a gene mutation is present in a family. And with ovarian cancer, because we don't have great screening tools at this point in time, if we understand there's a gene mutation in the family, we now have a tool to understand who has that mutation, who has the increased risk of developing ovarian cancer, and who may be eligible for a risk-reducing surgery. So this can not only impact the patient, but it can also impact the family, those recommendations that we have for the family. And same thing if genetic testing is negative. It can provide some reassurance for the family, but also we can have that discussion about what the family should do and when to consider additional genetic testing in the future. We've talked about that there are risk-reducing surgeries that are available, and then there's also increased screening for other types of cancers that may be important. And then there may be possible changes to treatment either at this point in time or later on down the line as we continue to learn more about hereditary cancer and how we can specifically treat certain forms of hereditary cancer. So the concerns, risks, and limitations of genetic testing. This is often something that comes up in our appointment with patients and families. There's a lot of concerns out there regarding, regarding genetic discrimination, regarding cost, and insurance coverage. And so I want to briefly touch on these um, just to give you some background information, but happy to answer more specific questions as well. So one of the biggest concerns that we have from patients and families is a concern regarding genetic discrimination. Will getting a genetic diagnosis actually impact your insurability at any point in time? And the short answer to this is generally speaking, no. There are caveats to this, um, and I won't go through all of those, but there's a federal law called the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Basically, this law was put in place about 10 years ago and focuses on health insurance and employability. And the health insurance that it's pertaining to are individuals who have commercial insurance, who may have a state-based insurance like Medicaid or have Medicare. So there are other insurance programs that are not covered by this law. But this means that with this law, that if someone has a genetic diagnosis, they can't be denied or dropped from their health insurance company. So that's one of the biggest questions that we get about this. But what this law does not cover are different types, other types of insurances. Supplemental disability insurance, long-term care insurance, life insurance, and those are really important um, insurances to a lot of families. And so that's something to think about with genetic testing. Now, oftentimes, if a patient has a personal history of ovarian cancer, another type of cancer, or other major medical issues, those are going to be viewed importantly when they are seeking those types of supplemental insurances. Um, so usually the a genetic test result isn't going to be greatly impacting that. Um, however, for healthy family members, undergoing genetic testing, that's something that we, always, we often ask them to think about, is, is supplemental insurance something that they want? Should they pause and wait? and have this discussion with an insurance agent or with other family members or with a lawyer before they think about genetic testing. So this is definitely something that um, is, is a very um, large topic that we want patients and families to be thinking about. As we have talked a little bit about, the cost in insurance coverage generally isn't as big of an issue as it used to be for individuals um, who are going through the genetic testing process. Emotional burden. So for some individuals and some families, getting a genetic diagnosis is very overwhelming. And some people just don't want that information. Um, 
so that can be a factor that impacts their, um, their ability to go through genetic testing. Also, where they're at with their diagnosis is important. Um, so if somebody has just been diagnosed with cancer, oftentimes they're thinking about their surgery, they're thinking about their treatment, and not necessarily focusing on genetic testing. Um, so this is something that um, we, we really think is important to think about is that emotional burden um, that can be associated with genetic testing and getting a genetic diagnosis. And then the, the last two um, seem related to one another, but we actually look at them a little bit different from a genetic standpoint. With genetic testing, sometimes we don't get a clear-cut yes or no result. Sometimes we can see a variation in a gene that we don't understand, and that can be frustrating for patients and families, is that we're not getting a yes or no, we're getting an I don't know result. Um, and then sometimes when we do this testing, although we're trying to find the answer to somebody's ovarian cancer, we may find something in another gene that has implications for another type of cancer, like colon cancer or kidney cancer, for example, and has no relationship with their actual ovarian cancer. So we may be finding something unexpected when we do genetic testing. And those are things to think about um, when going through this process. So to summarize, um, inherited gene mutations are found in about 15 to 20 percent of women with ovarian cancer. And all women with ovarian cancer are eligible for genetic testing. This doesn't mean that genetic testing will be covered or will be free, but I just want to emphasize that because of guidelines out there, all women who've had ovarian cancer should think about do they want genetic counseling and they know that they are eligible to have that conversation and eligible for genetic testing. That we now have multi-gene hereditary cancer panels and this should be something that should be considered. So if you've had negative BRCA1 and 2 genetic testing in the past, this doesn't eliminate that risk for hereditary cancer syndrome as we know there are other genes associated with ovarian cancer. So it's important to be asking your provider about the type of testing you had in the past and if you should be considering some additional testing in the future. And that, you know, lastly I want to end on, genetic testing has many benefits. And I work with a lot of families where I've seen they've been positively impacted by genetic testing, by finding a genetic diagnosis and having a tool to screen family members and ha offer screening as well as risk reducing surgery. But it does have its limitations and downsides as well and that's something that's important to think about and that's something that a genetic counselor will walk through with a patient and family as they're on their journey and thinking about genetic testing. So with that I will end. Thank you.